Welcome to chapter 11, in which we are going to look at one of the critical components of the services gap model, and that is where people get to be involved and where we deal with the human side of services delivery. Now, one of the things to understand here is that between the service delivery and the customer designs and the customer driven service standards, services key feature of intangibility is resident really in this part because it's a human delivered outcome experienced by other humans. So what we've got in this particular gap is a couple of areas that we deal with, uh, where the human resources policies fall down, where supply and demand becomes an issue, where the customers themselves don't know what roles they're supposed to play, and where our service intermediaries have some challenges in implementing their parts in the service product. But really this is a chapter about services, service culture, and in the extended marketing mix, people. So we have a couple of key critical ideas to draw your attention to. Boundary spanning roles, emotional labor, and the service employee's task in being both the face and the implementation of service. So across the chapter, what we're going to be looking at, challenges for boundary spanners and what it's like to be at the front line and what the technical aspects. Now, many of us will have held services marketing roles, have been frontline employees. What we're looking at here is a, a boundary spanning role, what your requirements would be from a marketing perspective. And also a couple of points here in terms of how to best or bring best practice and we have a model at the end of the slide deck that is about the strategies for delivering service quality. Now I'm going to overview that model, but there is more detail on it inside the slide deck and even more detail on it in the textbook. Again, this is one of those ones where it's because it's so broad, it's a really useful one to have a copy of the diagram to hand whilst you're reading through the chapter and Connect the dots, draw your own uh, crossovers and comparisons, and see how the wiring fits together. So let's look at why service employees matter. Now the first thing is that they are part of the services marketing mix. They're a core section. Uh, people is a key part of that mix. You also have the theory of the service profit chain, which I'm pushing that back to the chapter as well, because I want to talk more about the services triangle. Now the services triangle, again, 1995 was a good season for services theory in the mid-90s. With services marketing, you have a balance between the company, the service provider, and the customer. Now the company, or management, represents the control over the internal marketing and the external marketing. Now, in this diagram, it's unidirectional. So the internal marketing is the ability of a management team to enable a promise, enable a service provider or service employee to deliver the service product and deliver the service promise. The external marketing is where the promise is made to the audience. So you can see that the connection in the gaps model is quite strong here, that with the external marketing, you also see this model recur when we talk about integrated marketing communication. The service provider, the provider customer combination is one of the crucial aspects of this chapter. The interactive marketing, the interaction between marketer, service provider and customer is the delivery of the promise. Now, as we have established, services marketing is inconsistent, inseparable, intangible. So the people become embodiments of the service. They become the brand, both representation of the brand and also the product delivery. So on interactive marketing, the interactive component really relies on the strength of the individuals. So in terms of the triangle alignment, this is one of the things that's really important to appreciate is that you can misalign. So if you are over-promising but under-enabling, 
the triangle will tilt. If you are over-promising, you are enabling, but you're under-delivering, the triangle will compact. Or it's possible to have enabled the promise. Your staff can deliver the promise, but the company itself is not communicating the promise successfully to the market. So again, when the triangle is out of alignment, you have problems that need to be resolved at a strategic and tactical level. So in terms of the promise making, again, we're looking at service promise, service design. We're looking at the external communication here. And what's important when you're making a service promise is to ensure that this promise is communicated to your services staff. So a service promise, an external promise, and the establishment of expectations amongst customers must also be communicated to the employees so that they know what their role will be and they know what the customer is expecting of the service and possibly even of them. In terms of keeping the promise, this is service design. This is the actual boots on the ground, making it possible to be delivered. So we look here at the service delivery, we've got the service quality framework, we're looking at the service blueprints, the moments of truth, the touchstones. So you're really seeing this cross wiring, this cross networking, linking back and forth up and down the book. Because it comes down to, in this section, enabling the promise. And this is where we're going to talk about boundary spanning roles and strategies for delivering service through, quality service through people. This also requires marketers to step outside marketing for a moment and engage other areas such as human resource management, recruitment, staff, training, and the IT infrastructure underneath the firm. So you can't deliver a promise if you don't have the right staff. What you're looking for in staffing is to ensure that you have that the staff who are best able to deliver a service and have the best fit to the service promise that you are offering. Now one of the things I'll say on this front is that it's really important to ensure that your staff and your staffing requirements are considered and also are reasonable. Now one of the things that we run into on a regular basis, very negative publicity surrounding highly skilled staff not being hired by a firm who is prioritizing the visual aesthetic of a person over the technical competence. Baseline is that's a dumb thing to do and you deserve all the negative consequences that will come your way. Technical skill will beat aesthetic. Aesthetic and technical combined, great. Aesthetic on its own, someone being pretty helpful and cheerful is great, but someone being pretty and cheerful whilst they're being unhelpful or counterproductive will actually be more antagonistic. You'll be a greater service gap. So be careful about when you're talking about hiring the right people that you're not just doing this on one facet. You want to be hiring the skills, you want to be hiring the personalities that suit the environment you're trying to create. The other aspect to this is the employee empowerment, and this is a really important facet. Services are created by people. They are delivered by employees. They are delivered by staff. You need trust, commitment, and reciprocity as an internal marketing metric. You need to trust staff to be capable of doing their job. If they're not, you need to fix that problem. You also need to trust staff so you can empower them to solve problems as the problem arises. And with the commitment and the reciprocity, you are trusting them, they will trust you, they will feel safe in bringing back problems to the firm and being able to communicate and feed back the information loop you need to close the gaps that exist between the company's expectations, the service that's delivered, and the service that's perceived by the customer. So you've really got to be clever about this and you've really got to ensure that the internal marketing uses trust to ensure that the employee trusts the firm and the firm trusts the employee. 
commitment. Both of you are playing the long game. Both of you are playing for the ongoing survival of the firm. And reciprocity. If the employee does the right thing by the organization, the organization should do the right thing by the employee. And this is where the social media reciprocity aspect comes through. So if you're willing to fire someone for a tweet that they've said on social media, you've got to be either willing to hire or promote someone for something they said on social media. Now on a regular basis, people will say things that are inappropriate, inexcusable, and plain wrong in this area of you know, in racism, sexism, homophobia, a variety of other places. The thing is, if you own that employee 24-7, if they say nice things about you as well, you have to respect that and reward it as if they say that basically they do wrong, they get punished, but they do right, they got to get rewarded. So you've got to re align your rewards and incentives. You don't own someone 24-7 unless you're prepared to reward them and compensate them for after work activity. So just watch that one. It's one of the things where a lot of people are in positions where they can be fired for what they say in social media, but they get no benefit or reward for acting positively towards the organization. All right, the services marketing triangle, how to use it and where to use it. It's a strategic tool and it's a tactical tool. From the strategic top level, this is the services marketing triangle occasionally features as an assessment task. Uh, it's kind of a neat one if I wanted to give you, say, a 2,000 word essay on something. I'd say go using the services marketing triangle, I'm going to analyze the services, uh, a services product or services marketing of your organization. So you can look at what are you doing well, where are the strengths, where are the weaknesses, what needs to be done to improve, to capitalize on opportunities created by strength, to defend against threats created by weakness. In terms of specific service implementation, again, it's a great uh, mental checklist to say, is the internal market aligned with the external? Is the message we're sending outside being received by the in-house? Is the delivery taking place? Who's delivering the product? Are the support systems? Does the internal marketing support the delivery of the promised service? So, when we look at the services triangle, if we go, what is the promise we've made? Have we enabled our employees to deliver that? Are they delivering it? Is the customer satisfied? So you can use a services triangle as a checklist, as a think piece. The last thing I want to address in this chapter is I want to talk about the boundary standards. Now, in a chapter on services marketing, we will also be talking about roles and role stress and role guidance, role scripts. These are inside the chapter, give it a look. But the boundary spanner role is a very important aspect here because this is someone who works for you, who plays two distinct tasks. They are the ones who interface with the external customer, so they are a huge chunk of your revenue. They also, by interacting with the customer, are a wealth of market research information. They are internal marketers and they are internal market research agents. The thing is, boundary spanners are often not given the respect due to them. They are often seen as the cheapest or the frontline staff because they deal with the customer. And you know, management sits out to the side and you know, management is more expensive because you know, they do managey things. Well, the boundary spanners are the most valuable because they're the ones who are finding out is the product working. So in a boundary spanners role, you have a couple of challenges here. One is that you have emotional labor. Now, the nature of emotional labor is that you are required to be happy, cheerful, and helpful, irrespective of your own personal emotional state. Now, this emotional labor quite often creates role stress, where you are internally feeling one particular, your emotive response to environmental triggers, or particularly 
where you have an unpleasant customer and the customer has is mistreating you, your cognitive and emotive responses internally do not align with the emotional labor role that you are expected to play. You're supposed to maintain your professionalism, you're supposed to smile, yes, yes, no, yes, sir, and continue being calm and polite all the time dealing with someone who is not bound by any of those conditions. So emotional labor has a lot of wear and tear on it. Uh, it requires the suppression of true feelings on a regular basis. You can't tell the customer what you think of them. And also, it's where you're requiring the customer to be friendly, or you're requiring the customer to be friendly to customers, even though the customer themselves may be trying to take advantage of that. So, emotional labor is a challenging aspect of services marketing. Again, it's an area where we're not respecting it enough. Um, it's one of the things that if you want to be a really good services marketer, you want to look at physical labor, mental labor, emotional labor, and reward accordingly to the amount that you are expecting someone to spend on the delivery of your service. The other areas of conflict here are uh, the role conflict, where we'll come across this on a uh, frequent basis, where you are being expected to serve the customer, but you know you've got a boundary limit of you could solve the customer's problems, but that won't be what the firm is asking you to do. The firm wants you to only satisfy when you know with a little bit of extra effort and possibly some loss by financial loss of the firm, you could satisfy. So there are conflicts there. This is also the quality productivity trade-off, where we see this, uh, also this will come up in the discussion of demand management, where an excess demand, too many people in the uh, service, can lead to trade-offs of quality that to do it right is 15 minutes, to do it at an excellent level is 20. But if you've got a lot of customers in here, you want to be knocking these things out at 12, which is okay-ish enough. So at 12 minutes, you can knock five out in the hour. At 15 minutes, which is your, pre your quality, you're knocking four out in the hour. At 20 minutes, which is your premium, which is your delight level, you're only knocking three out in an hour. Productivity is five an hour at the same price. Productivity is more profitable, but it's not as good. And that will also come back to some of the emotional labor. Sometimes we expect staff to compromise quality or compromise personal or professional performance to meet deadlines or meet productivity cutoffs. All right, the last aspect, the diagram. Now, in the slide deck, the, this breaks out further, but I just want to talk to some of the key points. Customer oriented service delivery requires four elements. You need to hire the right people. That's the first thing. You need to recruit, not just from the point of view of technical skill, but you want role match. You don't want to bring someone who is technically brilliant but hates people and put them in the front line. That's a waste of resources. You want to put someone who is good with people with the people. Because the reverse can also happen. Is that you can have a highly skilled, uh, someone who's very good with their emotional labor, very good with their technical skills, great with customers, and they do so well you promote them to management and they never get to work with people and it's a disaster for them. So hiring the right people, providing the support systems, and this is where the service blueprint comes in to say, what is the back end? What is the infrastructure? What is the internal marketing required to keep things running? Retention, now this is an important part, is that customers form relationships and parasocial relationships with service providers and service staff. A good service employee is an asset, and they should be regarded as assets. 
and they should also be thought of as co-customers of the firm. Because if a customer is a co-producer, your producers should also be co-customers. Quite often they should be experiencing the firm. Um, this is one of the things I think airline and travel agencies were doing really well. Travel agencies were insistent that their staff travel. They got them cheap fares, they got them cheap accommodation, but what they were doing was not just upskilling the employee, because now the employee could talk about a location from personal experience, but they're also treating the employee as a customer. The employee was consuming the service, was consuming the environment, so they could actually start to understand some of the needs, wants, and roles. And the final thing on this is an employee is an investment. And this is one of the things that I quite often hear is they're referring to staff as cost centers. Now, there is a language of marketing and costs are negative. Costs are things to be cut, to be minimized. Investments are things to be expanded and enhanced. So if you think of your staff as investments, so you should be thinking about return on investment. With a good staff member, what do I get back from the revenue I invest in their training, in their retention, in their performance? What is my ROI? And if you're thinking about them that way, then you want to train them, you want to empower them, you want to have them in relationships of trust because they become the critical parts that make your service work. So don't think about, ser don't think about service employees as costs, think about them as assets, think about them as investments. Think about how you would develop and enhance their ability to do their job, to deliver their service. And think about how you will work them into the marketing of the organization so that they will provide you with the information, the boundary spanner information that will help you close a couple of the customer uh, company service gaps. All right, that's a wrap for this chapter. Uh, as always, if you need me at Stephen Dan or stephen.dan at anu.edu.au, big thing about this chapter is give it a read and consideration, but also think about how would you apply these ideas across other parts. So start when we come up to ServiceScape, when we're looking at Service Blueprint, when we're looking at the services marketing mix, how do these component parts fit together?